Damien, with something this sprawling and ambitious, I guess I'm curious where you even start and what the gestation process is like for a script like this. I mean, how long are you researching it and thinking about it, and then what's the spark that kind of gets you to actually sit down and start writing? It took about, yeah, 12 years or so, I remember, of just kind of the thing gestating. At first, um, I, I mean, I've always been sort of a, a you know fan of Hollywood history and, and, and old Hollywood, um, but I think the first thing that really sort of sparked this as a project was reading a certain kind of couple of things about this era that just really um, sort of threw me for a loop, that did not feel like they comported to what I had in my mind, what I realized was sort of a misconception in my mind of, of the early days of Hollywood. When you sort of dig into the, into, the, into the muck a little bit, you know, and you read, for instance, reminiscences of sort of people who were on the ground who haven't really, you know, weren't really PR trained to kind of tell their stories, um, you would hear things about you know, uh, about just the, the sort of the, the turbulence of the time, the, the, the amount of drugs floating through Los Angeles at the time, the, the, uh, the kind of recklessness with which movies were made, at least compared to today, and, and then the sort of way in which a society that allows that kind of uh, uninhibited, unhinged behavior, the way that that made that society, I would say, especially prone to being completely sort of bulldozed away by what otherwise might have seemed almost a trivial technological change, just this idea of putting sound on, you know, sync sound uh, uh, and marrying them to pictures. Um, something that had been tried in the early 20s, it had been tried in the mid 20s, you know, there were even sound films in 26, but it wasn't until you get to 27, 28 where it just suddenly takes off and I think it helped usher in a whole set of new moral codes, a new set of kind of regulations, a whole new outlook on Hollywood that before that had really been this kind of Wild West, West Coast outpost, outpost, very separate from Wall Street, separate from the East Coast, separate from Broadway, almost antithetical and oppositional to those things. But once sound comes in, once you get to the late 20s, you see this whole sort of influx of East Coast money, East Coast talent, Broadway talent, and a kind of respectability starts to settle into Hollywood that just, again, was very antithetical to the sort of vulgar, tawdry, you know, one step from the circus experience that I think the earlier silence um, sort of exhibited. So, uh, yeah, so it just sort of became this bigger story, I think, than, than, than I had used to think it was, and that ma made it feel like fodder for a movie. Yeah, well, Justin, I was fascinated to hear that one of your influences here was ACDC, and I was wondering if you talk a little bit about uh, what the kind of, you know, reference points were for you for this that were not 20s jazz. Yeah, we did talk about rock and roll a lot um, at the beginning. We knew we were going to use uh, the lineup of a jazz band with the brass section, the rhythm section, at least for the on-screen stuff, and a lot of the score as well. But we didn't want it to feel like 20s jazz. We didn't want it to have that kind of quaint, gentle feel that so much of the jazz, at least the jazz that was recorded back then, we wanted a lot of riffs, a lot of really heavy driving riffs. And so many of the pieces are built on that kind of strategy. And then we would give it to a unison horns or unison saxes, and it would give this real muscularity to it that felt very different than 20s jazz. So it was believable enough, I think, because it was the lineup of a 20s band so often, but it was a lot more muscular because it was built on that really like heavy riff-based uh, style of writing. Tom, I feel like you're using the music a lot to tie everything together and give a kind of unity to this crazy, chaotic, sprawling thing. I mean, I, you know, I think about the other movies that you've done with Damien, and, you know, they're ambitious movies, but they're essentially focusing on a couple of characters, usually. Here, you've got a lot more, and I, I'm wondering for you what some of the challenges were dealing with such a big ensemble and so many subplots, and how the music helped you kind of tie that stuff together. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that this, this was the most challenging movie I think we've worked on together, and it was probably the hardest movie I've ever worked on. Um, you know, you mentioned the other movies, Whiplash, La La Land. I mean, those were two-handers. First Man is kind of a single character movie. Um, you know, Damien always knew, you know, that this was going to be an ensemble. You know, the whole idea was to uh, show how people come to, these people come to Hollywood to be transformed. They come for a better life. They come, you know, they come to find a better version of themselves. And invariably, they're, they're transformed. Um, the other thing Damien was clear about is just that we were going to be making a maximalist picture. So the style was going to be very overt uh, out of the gate. It was We were just going to kind of throw in the kitchen sink. I mean, it was just go for broke. 
And, um, but at the same time, because I think, you know, the storytelling Damien would always talk about with me had to do with contrast. And so we might start maximalist, but, you know, because of the journey that these characters are taking, we may, we would invariably end up in different places. So sometimes we end up in a place where stylistically it's very quiet or it's, it's, it's classically put together. Um, such as the scene with Gene Smart and, and, and Brad Pitt. But yeah, I think, I think Justin's music, which I had from the very beginning, I mean, as soon as I got dailies, I already had rough demos of Justin's score um, that absolutely helped kind of glue the chaos together and also, you know, gave me something to follow in terms of pace and rhythm. You know, this up-tempo, uh, coked up, uh, often coked up, uh, energy was something that we could kind of bounce picture off of. For every every scene where picture where there was it was set to music, we we kind of repeated this this process. But it it made way for what you see in the picture. Uh, well, Mary, I have to say I was completely blown away by your work in this movie by the costumes because I feel like you know there there's so many great costumes in this movie. The characters are always trying to you know, they're, they're trying to convey who they want the world to think they are through their clothes. And my favorite example of that is Eleanor, the Gene Smart character. Like, and watching the movie again tonight, like, I just was blown away by every outfit she has. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your conception of that character and what you were trying to say about her and what she's trying to say about herself through what she's wearing. Um, well, first, we had the good luck to have to dress Gene Smart, who was not only statuesque and 5'10", which helped carry some of the concepts for her character, but she was, I mean, the, the pitch for her was that she should be, you know, when you first meet her in the movie, you recognize who she is amongst um, many, many other people at that party, and, and it's, you remember who she is, and then she continues that sort of outrageous um, depiction of herself, and it's just that this is her, she wants to draw as much attention to herself as all the people that she's covering in her in her writing, so that was the idea, is sort of an eccentric approach, and like I said, having Jean um, play the part was an extra bonus. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the look of the movie, I was wondering how, you know, what Tom was saying about this being a maximalist movie, and it has such kind of wildly varying tones, and it's kind of a more is more movie, how does that inform the approach to the cinematography? Oh, <clears throat> well, um, it's definitely, you know, the, the, the script and what Damien was looking for in our discussions was to not make it like a typically period movie, but rather uh, our view or like a modern view of, 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 of that. But um, I think the, the general idea was to be expressive, you know, and, and for me, it felt also like you don't want to light it like in an artificial way, but rather actually see how it looked back then for real and go into that gritty reality of the dirt and the sweat and the heat and the, the, the sort of dingy parts of the world and reality. And, and um, so with, also with, with the scope of the film being like um, so big, you wanted to be able to see everything um, in a way, like see, see everything in a big scope, but still go into the details. And, um, I think um, lighting-wise, it was a um, naturalistic approach, but um, with the sort of look of the film, we looked for something more expressive in a sort of impressionistic way, but like in, a, in an expressive way. So um, we, we explored different ways of treating the film stock and we push process the whole film uh, to create contrast and to see uh, color better. And, to, um, to, and, and the, the lighting is sort of naturalistic, right? It's just that we have... Um, uh, had, had also contrast the approach to, to things in order to help the dynamic um, part of that. And, and Flo, I'm assuming that you know, the research on a movie like this for a production designer must be a lot of fun and also extremely uh, arduous and, and thorough. Uh, and I'm curious for you if, you know, the way that Damien was talking about how when he re was doing his research, he kind of made these discoveries, the things that surprised him. Um, what were some of your favorite discoveries in the research process and uh, what surprised you about this era and that found its way into the production design? Um, well, I really have to start with the script. I mean, Damien wrote this amazing world that the first read was really 
inspiring for me because I just wanted to jump into those visuals. And the thing that surprised me was in 1926, when our story starts, Los Angeles was in its really early days of development. You know, they were just starting to do all the urban planning, and we quickly we found this image of Beverly Hills in 1926 with this big dirt road and the singular palm tree, and we really connected on the fact that that was where we wanted the environment and the visual story to start. Um, and we looked to a lot of research that ranged from uh, the real depravity that was happening in Los Angeles. We found those census photographs of the homeless issues in the 1920s. Uh, and then in contrast, all of uh, this world that people were building, um, all the architecture that was happening and all the influences that ranged from you know, Spanish Revival, Gothic, Tudor, um, and Damien wanted the film to not feel like we do on many period films, that it's not 1926, that it's inspired by earlier periods or what's to come. So it was always like this constant process of finding research and cobbling that together and then creating like our own expressionistic version of saying, uh, what are these characters going through? And what was really fun is tapping into like the early prototypes of what the camera boxes look like, what the microphones look like, how that quickly developed. So even as we progress in those sets in the sound era, uh, that they're developing and changing. And, you know, we really tried to build the world as they were doing it and the excess and the depravity and show those contrasts throughout. Now, in terms of the excess, you know, Andy, uh, watching that opening party sequence, to, yeah, <laughs> watching that opening party sequence today, I was just thinking what a task you had in terms of there's so much cacophony and yet you, you, and you give a sense of the chaos and the cacophony and yet you're still... Uh, the dialogue is still completely clear. You hear everything you're supposed to, to hear. I mean, what for you were the biggest challenges on this movie? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, pretty much everything, I think. Uh, that, I mean, <laughs> coming on as kind of the last creative process in, in the making of the film uh, when we do the sound mix is kind of an advantage in some ways because I'm I can have the eyes and ears of an audience in a sense because I haven't, had the journey of making it up to that point and getting used to things. So I can be the one to sit with Damien and say, I think we need to make this a little clearer because I'm not fully understanding something. Whereas everybody else might be more familiar because they've been living with it for a while. So uh, for me, working with the music, I mean, it was, it was incredible because we had to create these dynamics, huge dynamics, which I think were the real punctuations of the film and the turning points and the corners of the film. So it was... Um, it, it, there were a lot of challenges, and, and going into the kinescope set, for instance, in silent movies, I mean, the cacophony that was created through all the dialogue, the sound effects, all the different pieces of music that you hear as you journey through, is such a wonderful contrast to then going to this first time they shoot sound where it's dead silent, and every single little squeak and movement is, is carefully monitored and structured. I didn't like the way the sound guy was treated in that sequence, but that's another story. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, it was uh, everything. I mean, it was an incredible challenge, but we, we had a lot of fun doing it. And um, yeah, it was great. Well, I feel like we're just getting started, but we're already uh, out of time. So thank you all so much for coming and uh, talking with me about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.